Welcome to episode 28 of the Growing Space podcast. Today, we are picking up with our Meet the Plant Families mini series. Earlier this year, I did several different episodes where I introduced you to some springtime, some cool weather plant families. And now it is time to pick this up and feature two of our warm season plant families. Today, we are going to be talking about the cucurbitaceae plant family. The cucurbitaceae family is also referred to as the gourd family. And within this plant family, we find our lovely cucumbers, gourds, of course, melons, squashes, and pumpkins. We are going to talk all about these delicious summery fruits in today's episode of the Growing Space podcast. Thanks so much for being here, and let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Growing Space podcast. I'm your host, Farmer Erin, owner of The Patio Farmer, and I believe that no matter what size space you have, you can grow food at home. Tune in every Tuesday as I share my best tips, tricks, and encouragement for tending to homegrown edible plants. I'm here to support your food growing journey. The Growing Space podcast is sponsored by Plant Club by The Patio Farmer. Plant Club by The Patio Farmer is a monthly subscription service I started in 2020. It's a membership-based opportunity to take your growing journey to the next level. With four different membership options, you get to decide the amount and kind of support that's right for you. All Plant Club members receive access to my online community through a platform called Circle. Having access to this platform allows members to share pictures, ask questions, celebrate harvests, and get to know each other. All Plant Club members also have access to free seeds each month, along with information on how to plant and tend to their crops, with seeding instructions and downloadable resources, from the Patio Farmers Resource Library. Membership starts at just $14 a month. Join Plant Club today by visiting my website, thepatiofarmer.com slash membership. As you'll remember from previous Meet the Plant Family episodes, I like to structure these episodes of this mini series First, by talking about the different physical characteristics of the plants, I feel that it's really helpful to draw these connections and understand these similarities between members of a plant family because it helps us understand and anticipate how we can harvest and expect our plants to do throughout the growing season. So we're going to go over some of those family traits, if you will. And as we do, we'll obviously touch on how the plants like to grow, how they produce fruit. Then we'll jump in and talk through, you know, as the home grower, how you all will want to plan out your space and give some considerations on how to plant these lovely members of the cucurbitaceae plant family. And we'll also talk a little bit about maintenance. So anything that we are growing in the summertime, especially if you live in the southeastern United States. Um, Just as a reminder for everyone listening, I am based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we are in the USDA hardiness zone 8A. So we are able to grow food all year round in our mild climate, um, but we are also known to have very hot humid uh, summer seasons. We'll talk about the nuances with growing these summer fruits in a hot, humid environment a little later on. Uh, Then we'll wrap up. I'll give you a little sneak peek for next week's episode. And we're going to end this week's episode with a little confession. And that will be our sign-off tidbit for today's episode. Uh, Yeah business ownership and coaching definitely keeps you humble, let me just say. But I've got a fun little message for you at the end, which I think you'll find helpful. So great. Okay. 
So let's talk about these cucurbits. All of the members of the cucurbitaceae plant family are frost sensitive. If you plant these and we happen to get a late season frost, a mid spring frost, you will want to cover, go out and cover your plants at night um, and then uncover them the next day because they do not tolerate a frost or a freeze. Um, so that's the first characteristic to mention at the top of this episode. Um, and that's why they make such great summer growers for us in our region. Now, these plants are also typically vining plants. You know, they like to kind of creep along the ground. You can also grow them vertically on a trellis, which is usually what I try to do, especially if I am growing um, cucumbers or maybe some butternut squash or something like that. I try to keep them elevated or at least spaced properly. We'll talk about that in a sec when we talk about planting these. But they do have very large vines that come with them. So that's something important to know about any member of the cucurbitaceae plant family. Summer squash, like a yellow crookneck squash or a zucchini, they tend to, I mean, they still technically grow on vines, but their vines are much more, dare I say the word, compact. <laughs> compact is not, is not an adjective that I would use to describe this plant family in general. But if I had to point to one member of this plant family that does like to grow in a little bit more of a contained or like a fully anticipated way, it would be a summer squash or a zucchini. Most of the others are going to vine. And this is really cute. This is one of my favorite traits of the cucurbitaceae plant family, but they will send out, you especially see this on your cucumbers, but they like to send out this little tendril is what they're called. But the tendril is what shoots out from the vine. It's kind of like Velcro-y almost, or it acts kind of like Velcro. And what a tendril's purpose is, is to reach out and grab onto something sturdy and hold, like, pull the plant towards or the source of structure. They can like even wrap around a couple of times and it's just like the plants attempt to seek support. I think they're really cute, but they can also be kind of irritating if they start to grab on to plants. <laughs> I usually try to put a good bit of space between my cucumbers and my tomatoes and other more vertically growing uh, summer vegetables for that reason. Another super important characteristic about members of the cucurbitaceae plant family is that they are flowering plants. They produce a flower. And then from that flower is where you will see a fruit form. Now, the flowers on members of the cucurbitaceae plant family are unisex, or they just have parts that are either male or female. So what this means is that wherever you see a flower, it doesn't necessarily mean that's where you'll get a fruit. Now, you obviously will get a fruit from a female flower on these plants that has been successfully pollinated. So in order to get that fruit, a little pollinator has to come along, fly around, and land on a male flower. And then, you know, dance around, get some pollen, hang out, and then hop over to a female flower and do the same thing um, in order for that female flower to then produce a fruit. Um, so it's really, really important that you have a lot of pollinators, that you encourage pollinators to your space whenever you are growing members of the cucurbitaceae plant family. Um, and some great ways to attract more pollinators to your space are to avoid using any harmful chemicals like pesticides or herbicides. Even if you're uh, using those products on your lawn, for the most part, it can still affect pollinators. And then also planting things, other flowering things, you know, in and around your summer vegetables will help encourage more bees, more butterflies uh, to your space. So support your pollinators, 
Now, fun fact about the fruit of these plants is that it's actually, the fruit is actually considered a berry. Yep. So like a cucumber or a squash or even like a butternut squash or pumpkin, they're actually considered berries. I know. So there you go. (laughs) And you'll also hear their fruit sometimes called a pepo. That is their like technical name is pepo. Those are the main characteristics that I think are important to call out about members of the cucurbitaceae plant family. Let's switch and start talking about planting and getting your space ready for for adding members of the cucurbitaceae plant family. Some of the members of this plant family do benefit from being trellised. If it was me, I would 100% recommend trellising your cucumbers and asking them to grow vertically for many reasons, uh, mainly to do with the maintenance section of this episode, which we'll get to here in a second. But members of this plant family like a well-balanced, super nutritious soil to grow in. So if you're using a fresh potting soil, that's great. Uh, They will be super happy there. If you are building upon an existing soil, then um, just adding some good, high-quality, well-cured compost, my favorite store-bought compost, just as a reminder, are earthworm castings and mushroom compost. I always have really great success with those two products in particular. Of course, you can make your own compost as well. Just make sure that it is rested for 60 to 90 days before you apply that to your soil. It's best for uh, your plants to absorb nutrients if you allow that compost to fully rest and cure uh, before you put it in your soil. And then you also want to add a little bit of plant food Uh, before you plant your cucurbitaceae's. And I like to use a vegetable and tomato. They're usually like that plant food is usually labeled vegetable and tomato plant food because it has a little bit higher phosphorus content and potassium. And both of those macronutrients are going to be helpful to your cucurbitaceae plants. Phosphorus, as a reminder, it helps the plant to create strong roots and it also helps to create seed. So because we are after that berry, that fruit of the plant where the seeds are, we want to encourage a little bit more phosphorus in the soil to help develop that seed when it's time, right? And then potassium is an important macronutrient because that's what helps the plant hold on to heavy things. Pumpkins are heavy things. (laughs) to hold on to for the little plant. Uh, you want to make sure that you've got some some potassium in your soil as well to help them. Out. So making sure that your soil is all ready to go, nice and happy. But when you go to plant these cucurbitaceae's, uh, you want to make sure that you're giving them plenty of space. Plenty of space. Do not overcrowd members of the cucurbitaceae plant family. I usually like to space them every two to three feet in my raised beds. Um, And if you're growing in containers, sometimes that gives you a little bit more flexibility because you can move your containers and move your plants as needed to increase the amount of space around them. If you are growing in a container, you want the amount of soil that would fill a five-gallon bucket for, for one plant. I like to use a seed for these. Hands down, for sure. These plants also have fairly sensitive root systems. And anytime you go to transplant a vegetable or move it from one pot to another, it can cause stress on the plant. And sometimes it takes a little longer for the plant to get settled, you know, in its new little home. And despite the greatest efforts from even the highest quality uh, plant nurseries or plant shops where you might be picking up seedlings from. There's always a chance for the introduction of disease or a pest even. 
before you get home and get your plants planted. My recommendation to you is to just pop a little seed in the soil and watch it grow. Uh, Sometimes I will do two seeds per hole so that, you know, I'm kind of hedging my bets that (laughs) I'll get one plant to pop up. Of course, one seed is one plant. But whenever I plant multiple seeds in one hole and they both come up, then I just go in and pull the one that looks not as strong. I know it's a very like Darwinian practice, but that's what I do. You can always just seed one seed, see how that does, and then go back in and plant another seed if that one happens to not come up. When you plant your seeds, you want to plant them maybe like half an inch, a quarter to a half an inch down into the soil. And you just cover it lightly. There's no need to like pat the soil firmly and make sure you water it in. It's always a good practice to water your seeded areas every day until you see that seed pop up out of the soil and have germinated, sprouted, started growing for you. When you're seeding, you have your seeds like within the top inch or two maybe of soil. So you want to keep that uh, top layer of soil moist, just moist, doesn't have to be saturated, just nice and moist while the seed is trying to sprout. Then once the seed sprouts, and if you're planting earlier in the season, you can start watering every other day. Once we're in like the throes of summer, you're probably going to be watering more frequently than every other day, probably once a day. And if you're growing in containers, depending on the material of your container, you could be watering more frequently. But I would start with every other day. And then as your plants are growing and we're getting warmer weather, might have to increase that water. And of course, (laughs) we have to talk about sunlight. So wherever you plant members of the cucurbitaceae plant family, You want to make sure you're getting eight plus hours of direct sunlight per day. These little guys, they love sun. They need lots of energy, lots of support from their environment to grow and thrive. So these little guys need eight plus hours of direct sunlight. So put them wherever you get the most sun. There is no such thing as too much sun for your plants. So make sure you're supporting them with plenty of beautiful, radiant sun energy. Oh, I do just want to talk a little bit about cucurbitaceae maintenance and why that spacing, access to sunlight, watering is so important and talk a little bit more about the the heat and humidity and its effect on these plants. So another important characteristic to keep top of mind as we move towards the summer about these cucurbitaceae plants is their big, broad leaves and the fact that naturally they like to vine and grow along the soil, right? And what those big, broad leaves do, obviously, is they're taking in lots of sunlight, lots of energy to create those fruits, but they are also a great little landing pad for fungal spores. Yep. So (laughs) fungal disease is a huge maintenance uh, topic to touch on when we talk about members of this plant family. And those big, broad leaves being close to the earth help to provide a little canopy, a little shade, a cozy little home for bugs as well. So as we're talking about members of this plant family, we have to talk about fungal disease and pests because both of these things are usually soil borne. So they pop up from the earth and can affect these low lying plants in some fairly significant ways. There are two uh, common fungal diseases to be mindful of when you're growing members of the cucurbitaceae plant family, and those are powdery mildew and downy mildew. Now, usually it takes, you know, a couple weeks to a couple of months to start having a true concern for these diseases. Once like July hits and definitely once August hits, 
I am extra vigilant about any growing space that I'm going to to pay attention for these fungal diseases. So really, once we're in the throes of summer, it's the dog days of summer, that's when you want to be extra mindful of the impacts of heat and humidity. Let's talk about these two fungal diseases first. So powdery mildew manifests on the tops of your leaves. Usually the lowest leaves will see stress and signs of mildew first because they're closest to the soil and powdery mildew is soil born. Um, But powdery mildew will show up on the tops of your bottom leaves and it looks like bright white little splotches. It really looks powdery. Then we have downy mildew. Downy mildew also will show up first on those lower bottom leaves, Uh, but downy mildew actually has like grayish beige brown spots. Both of these fungal diseases can be treated in a similar way. Whenever you're interacting with a plant fungal disease, you want to be super mindful that fungus spreads through spores and through contact. So it spreads through the air. When you touch a part of your plant that has fungus, and then you happen to touch another part of your plant that is healthy, you can be transferring that fungus from the affected part of the plant to the healthy part of the plant. So be super mindful as you are treating for fungal disease. Basically, you want to remove any affected branches or pieces of your plant And then you want to take those trimmings, those cuttings, and take them straight to wherever you put your yard waste, whether you have a special bin for that or you just bag it up and put it in your trash can. Don't leave the leaves that have fungal disease on them out and around your other plants. Again, just keeping in mind the fact that it's a fungal disease and how fungal diseases spread. You don't want to be perpetuating this issue that you're trying to treat for. Then it's a good idea to go ahead and wash your hands, wash your arms, whatever you feel like those leaves and branches may have come in contact with. And then you want to use some kind of fungicide spray. Do some kind of fungicidal application. My favorite product to use is neem oil, N-E-E-M. Neem oil is actually an insecticide, a miticide, and a fungicide. Um, And I like to use like a concentrated version of it that I dilute in water before I spray. Um, And that's good to just spray, you know, all over the leaves, especially those lower bottom leaves to help knock back any spores that may have landed while you were removing the affected leaves. Now, something important to know about using neem oil is you want to use this and really any spray, any treatment that you're doing, you want to spray in the morning or in the evening. And that's important for two reasons. One, if you use one of these topical sprays in the middle of the day, you can actually burn your plants or stress your plants out more, especially if it's a hot, sunny day. Neem oil is a broad spectrum, so it doesn't focus on one particular pest or disease. It treats all funguses, and it affects all insects. You see where I'm going here? So you want to use neem oil when your pollinators are not active or not as active, because if they come in contact with that neem oil, they can be negatively impacted. So spray any topical sprays in the morning or the evening to lessen your impact on pollinators. And yeah, That is how I treat any summer fungal disease. And we'll talk more about some other fungal diseases in next week's episode as we talk about our other summer plant family. Now, another maintenance tidbit piece of advice to pass along when you are tending to members of the Cucurbitaceae plant family. And you guys, I'm sorry. Like, I apologize in advance if this is triggering for some people. But we have to talk about the vine borer, the squash vine borer. Now, this little guy usually affects your summer squash and your zucchini 
although they can affect other types of squash as well. Also, before I get to that, just a pop quiz, checking in here. What do you think a summer squash is versus a winter squash? Well, a summer squash is like your your yellow crookneck squash, a zucchini, maybe even a cute little patty pan. Oh, they're so precious. Those are all summer squashes. And then a winter squash. What do you think a winter squash is? I feel like I need the Jeopardy like theme music playing behind me. <laughs> so a winter squash is a butternut squash, an acorn squash, spaghetti squash, kabocha squash, buttercup squash, delicata. Uh, let's see. Pumpkins, of course, are a winter squash. And while they are called winter squashes, so these are your squashes that have that hard outer rind to them. And while they're called winter squashes, we actually plant those and grow those in the warm season. So don't wait until fall to plant your butternut squash. Those need to go in no later than mid-June. They grow, they take a really, really long time to grow, like somewhere between 100 to 120 days usually. And so if you plant them in early June, then you have June to July, July to August, August to September, September to October. So somewhere between September and October, you can harvest those. And that's why we consider them to be more of a fall vegetable, but they are actually planted in the summer. So if you want to grow any of those, plant them earlier than you might have thought. Also, quick little shout out, and then we'll get back to the squash vine borer. I know I'm just like prolonging this section. (laughs) But if you are interested in growing any of these uh, cucurbitaceae plants and you're wanting to start them from seed, you should check out my online store. I will put the link in today's show notes, but you can order directly from me on my online store and I will ship seeds to you Um, as long as you live in the contiguous uh, 48 states in the U.S. Um, Unfortunately, I can't ship to Alaska and Hawaii. Um, Shout out to any listeners there. Would love for you to say hey sometime because that'd be cool to know who you are and how you're listening and all that good stuff. Anyway, um, and I can't ship them internationally at this time, unfortunately. But anywhere else in the U.S., I can send you seeds. Okay, so back to the vine borer. Sorry, that was an epic aside. It's important to call out that the vine borer primarily affects your summer squash. It mainly affects your patty pans, your yellow crooknecks, your zucchini. The moth will dig in, usually to like fairly mature plants, which is why this is super annoying. But she will dig in to the very base of the plant and lay her eggs Once those eggs mature and the baby larvae hatch, then they have to eat their way out of the vine, out of the center of the vine, which is where they were hatched. And that is the devastating part because they're literally eating through the very base, the growing center of your plants. And then they have to emerge, you know, so then they come out of your plants. It's like the craziest thing feels very like plant zombie-esque. That can be very detrimental to your plant's overall health. Or the way that you know that you need to check for a vine borer issue is if your plant looks nice and happy and healthy one day, and then you come out the next day and all of a sudden it is just super wilted and looks very collapsed and unsupported. That is your indication that you need to go hunting for the vine borer, and chances are it's probably a little too late to save that plant. Now, there are some people out there who like to get really hands-on and try to dig out the larva from inside the plant while still keeping the plant alive. By all means, if that speaks to you, have at it, hunt away. (laughs) That does not speak to me. So what I like to do instead is use diatomaceous earth. And diatomaceous earth is a it's a silica product and it's a desiccant. Um, so it's really effective to use on soft-bodied bugs and insects like larvae. 
but you sprinkle it usually around the base of the plant. Once I have summer squash that have germinated from seed outside, I will put a little bit of diatomaceous earth right up against that baby seed and around the soil of the seedling. And as a bug or an insect crawls or lands on that diatomaceous earth, it will begin to dry out their exoskeletons and it can even like like scratch them and pierce their exoskeletons as well. So it really is a great deterrent in that way. Another way that you can try to treat or prevent this issue or the vine borer from returning is to skip a year of planting summer squash, which can be pretty challenging to do, especially if you're a big squash lover. Also, I do just like to mention that sometimes rotating your crops or or skipping a year of planting your crops, uh, it can be hit or miss depending on where you are and how you're growing. Basically, if you skip a year of planting your summer squash, but your neighbor next door plants summer squash, then those overwintered bugs will just move over to your neighbor's yard for a year, probably do the same thing to their plants, and then they will die back. They'll overwinter in their yard. And then next year, when you think you're in the clear and you plant squash again, then they will just find their way back to your house. So, you know, just keep in mind your neighbors, where you live. If you, if you, you know, live in a more like isolated or buffered area where you don't have neighbors super close by, then you'll be probably more successful with skipping a season or a year of planting squash to knock those back. So I just touched on three different issues that you could have with members of the cucurbitaceae plant family, but don't think that there's not more. I just wanted to cover those top three. Just make sure that you keep your plants spaced properly and supported um, with healthy soil nutrients, that you are watering them appropriately. You know, another good thing to do when you are watering is to water around the plant at the very base of the soil versus over the plant. Again, just trying to keep those leaves nice and dry to help prevent the introduction of those fungal spores and keeping plenty of airflow and access to sunlight are two of your best lines of defense against pest and disease issues on your cucurbitaceae plants. That is a wrap for the information that I wanted to pass along to you all today about the cucurbitaceae plants. Next week, we are going to talk about the Solanaceae plant family, which of course is the nightshades. So tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, potatoes, and some more lovely edible summer veggies coming your way next week as we talk about the Solanaceae plant family. Now, before we wrap up today, I do just want to mention uh, my masterclass if you are interested in signing up. That is something that you can sign up for and participate in at your leisure anytime you are ready. I will put a link in today's show notes for that masterclass. It's called The Six S's to Success. Um, You can also access that from anywhere in the world that you are. I'm using the link in today's show notes. But through that masterclass, I have over four hours of instructional content where I walk you through uh, sun, space, soil, season, seed, and supervision. Those are the six S's (laughs) to success. And I walk you through each one of those in great detail. It's like a full download of information from me. Um, And then I also have lots of resources, handouts, guides, publications. There's like a whole library. I think I counted it up before I launched the masterclass. And I think I've got something like 25, maybe 26 different worksheets, downloads, guides, tools, etc. built into the masterclass. So if you're interested in signing up for that, you can do that, like I said, at any time using the link in today's show notes. I will also put a link to my online store if you want to purchase any seeds from me. 
I source all uh, certified organic and or open pollinated uh, seeds for all of my clients and customers. So you can purchase those anytime using uh, my online store. If you have listened to this podcast in the past, then you will know that at the end of every episode, I like to share a little tidbit, a little morsel of information with you all as we sign off. And today is my confession. And I feel I feel a little embarrassed to admit this, uh, but I totally misinterpreted uh, some information about the last average frost date. Perhaps you guys have already caught this. And if you have, thank you for your grace. If you haven't, thank you for your grace anyway. But I have been sharing that the last average frost date is predicted with a 30% probability. So that would mean that the last average frost date, which for my region is April 5th of this year. And what I have been sharing is that that last average frost date is predicted with a 30% probability. And that is incorrect. It is actually predicted with a 70% probability, which means that there is a 30% chance that after April 5th or whatever your frost date is for your hardiness zone, there is a 30% chance that you will get a frost after that date. What I have been sharing previously is that that date is predicted with a 30% probability, which would mean that there's a 70% chance that we could get a frost after that date. And that's not true. (laughs) Oh, geez. Yeah. Well, I do apologize for that misinterpretation of information and sharing that information incorrectly with you all. So please forgive me. That said, I am still pretty adamant that um, I like to give myself like a two to three week buffer after that last average frost date to plant for summer vegetables. So my goal is going to be to plant a summer veggies probably in early May. Um, I'm still enjoying my spring vegetables in my space and waiting to get that next round of vegetables in personally. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for putting up with me. (laughs) And I hope that you found today's episode helpful. And uh, yeah, cheers to all of the amazing cucurbitaceae harvests that we have ahead for us this year. Thanks again for tuning into this week's episode of the Growing Space Podcast. I hope that you learned something new and that you were able to take this new information home with you and implement into your growing journey and into your growing space. As always, I am here to support you and your food growing journey. If you'd like to learn more about the different services and resources and membership programs that I run through The Patio Farmer, please check out my website, thepatiofarmer.com. You can also follow me on social media. I am on Facebook, Instagram, and oh my gosh, most recently, TikTok. Wow. I know. I know. Here I am. Patio Farmer is on TikTok. It's very exciting. If you enjoyed today's episode, please give it a like or a rating or a review if you want. Maybe share a little comment about your favorite part of the episode. Share it with a friend. The more interactions I get with my little podcast online, the more I'm able to help people just like you in their food growing journeys. As always, thanks for being here and I will see you again next week.